very much, Stefan. Thank you very much uh, for having me at this wonderful seminar. I'm really glad to be to be part of it. It's uh, well, it's actually the first time I give a talk in well in Germany. I'm in France, but uh, for you, <laughs> my German colleagues, about my book. And you, you said it, uh, Stefan. The book will appear in Germany in May under the title "Überfluss und Freiheit." So. Um, I give you a very general outlook on my research, my method, my understanding of the history of social and political ideas. And then I focus on the main theoretical outcome of this research, which is the unmaking and remaking of social democracies, institutions and conceptual ground through the experience of the climate crisis. So uh, I proceed by ex first exposing uh, 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 um, I mean, my, my discontent with how the, the ecological issue was raised historically in the 60s, 70s, and then explain to you uh, why I felt the need to develop a new historiographical method to think about the conjoined history of modern political thought and ecological matters. And then I go back to contemporary issues and I'll try to discuss, uh, if I have time, two themes, two uh, aspects of the contemporary green critique of capitalism or the green critique of the, the contemporary uh, political economy. So, um, first uh, uh, point. <coughs> so, one of, the, one of the first puzzles I try to solve while working on the book is, why has the ecological concern never really been understood as a social issue, as an integral, integral part of what we in France call uh, la question sociale or the labor question, social question. So on one side, we have or we used to have environmentalists who try to precisely overcome and maybe escape the political realm by claiming that preserving nature is an overarching and neutral human interest. For example, it's a, it's a striking feature of classic American environmentalism. And then I think it's true as well uh, about post-war internationalist or Onusian green humanitarianism. All those visions promoted the idea of a post-political, of a species-wide consensus about the interconnectedness of humankind and nature. In this uh, post-political consensus building, it was all a matter of science, a matter of facts, and all these were substituted to political power struggle and maybe even class-based movements. And on the other side, at the same uh, period of history, political thought, mainstream political thought, whether it is liberal or Marxist oriented, insisted that the political, what of that what defines the political is the realm of intersubjective or interclass conflict, that social norms and governmental regimes are the product of collective autonomy. Borrow from Karl Marx from the book three of uh, Das Kapital. In this framework, freedom begins where necessity ends. And since nothing to do in authentic political debates. Is the connection good enough? The last sentence couldn't be heard because you were okay. freeze at one point. If it's just a sentence, no problem. <laughs> okay, so that is why the environment. maybe just an elite concern, and even sometimes at worst, a betrayal of progressive politics by something like a conservative naturalism. We had this debate in France in the 90s, for example, through a, a, a paper by Marcel Gaucher entitled Behind the Love of Nature, the Hate of Mankind. See, I'm pretty sure in Germany, the kind of, this kind of debate happened as well. So po since politics finds its dignity by transcending the realm of material determinations, by opening the field of human freedom, 
So claiming that nature matters was massively considered and sometimes still is considered a return, a return to primitive thoughts and a primitive condition. In this polarization between post-political environmentalism and uh, 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 anti-ecological progressive politics, uh, we are left with two unsat unsatisfying sides. On one side, the green depoliticization carried out by diplomats, all too naive scientists, or sometimes uh, 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 millenarist thinkers. And on the other side of this tragic divide, the inability of social justice thinkers to incorporate the sense of limits or the critique of growth to the foundations of critical thought. Uh, so clearly all this is a problem for political philosophy. But it's also, I think, a problem, an issue for the history of ID, for how we practice <coughs> the history of ideas, for histori historiography. Because our reflexive historical consciousness is clearly not adjusted to grasp the origins of the climate and biodiversity crisis, is unable to locate this crisis within our own political development. So I then realized that our understanding of the process of modernization had been deeply challenged by the history of science and technology, by STS, by the new uh, research on the anthropology of modernity provided by people like Latour, Descola, people you, you, you told us about, Stefan, by environmental history, in a broad meaning. I mean, not only the history of the green movements, but the history of how nature was shaped by modern knowledge, by power relations since the great scientific and political revolutions. And I think that uh, 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 political and social philosophy was or is still lagging behind because it is still centered on previous paradigms of modernization focused sometimes on the process of state building, on the development of civil society and its internal tensions, or in other cases, focused on class struggles, on the founding values of, uh, 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 or the founding values of liberal democracies. But not much was done to adjust our understanding of contemporary issues to the new fields of knowledge I mentioned above, and uh, most of all, uh, environmental history. So to put it quickly, I think we needed, we still need, a rewriting of the history of political ideas that locates the development of modern normative claims and first of all, freedom and secondary property sovereignty. So to locate the development of those modern normative claims within the emergence of new ecological standards and practices. And among them, the improvement of land, the conquest, the conquest of productivity by Empire and Co. to borrow from uh, 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 Kenneth Palmer's analysis in The Great Divergence. So if we consider modern political thought only as a matter of state building, of secularization process, of class struggle, I don't think we can grasp the deeply historical and political character of the climate crisis. We are condemned to understand it as an historical accident, as a purely external event. And I would add that re reducing the ecological crisis to any one of these historical and political patterns leads to, misunder to historical misunderstandings and to false solutions. So what in the book I, I call the environmental history of political ideas, that's the subtitle of the book, is my attempt to build an alternative understanding of what we inherit from the past, an understanding pretty much, uh, I mean, heavily indebted toward environmental history, hence the name. Uh, so my main concern was with the history usually built by advocates of the green movement. It's usually a history of how techno-scientific development uh, 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 produced uh, ecological collapse, or it's sometimes a history of how aesthetic and moral, moral qualities were attributed to nature or a history of how the interconnectedness of all things was discovered. It's usually a 
a poor historical reflexivity focused on the origins of an environmental consciousness and vastly disconnected from socioeconomic concern from critical thought. And uh, 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 so there is a big difference between the history of environmental ideas, and by that I mean ideas that are explicitly forged to address the ecological crisis, and this is not what I'm inter interested in, and the environmental history of ideas that focuses potentially on any political, political idea from the perspective of how it contains prescriptions about how to treat resources, territory, knowledge. So my idea is really not to go back to the past and look for the roots of who we are as our ecologists. It's not, it's not about dressing the list of glorious or unheard. Understand how the set of concepts that defines modernity and again, freedom, sovereignty, property. So how this set of concepts is shaped by an environmental concerns. For example, the control over space, relationship with non-agrarian societies, and obviously the distribution of the benefits of industry. Uh, uh, somehow different historical background I hope the current crisis doesn't appear anymore as something beyond politics or something that betrays uh, the cult of political autonomy against nature. So maybe uh, 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 let's now go back to the issue of conceiving the ecological question as a problematic higher to the labor or the social question. So more uh, 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 recent issues. So, and this is my third point. So, since the advent of industrial capitalism, and even more with post-war wealth, what we could call welfare capitalism, collective emancipation is rooted in productivity and the infinite extensions of productivity. In a strange but really interesting text by French philosopher Alexandre Kojève, we find a very interesting formulation of this issue. It's, it, it's, in, a, it's in a text written uh, uh, at the demand of Carl Schmitt, and he, he, it's a lecture he gave in Germany in the 50s with Carl Schmitt. So Alexandre Kojev uh, pretends that Henry Ford realized Marx's dream by offering a compromise between labor productivity and labor discipline on one side, and on the other side, the social reward in the form of consuming power. So, uh, Kojev pretends that capitalism overcame its contradiction by, in its own terms and conditions and by its own means and escaped the fate of revolution only by sustaining growth. And that's the reason why it's actually a, 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 con a, a conference on colonialism also by a process of land appropriation and obviously surplus value appropriation. But there is a second or third aspect of uh, 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 the, 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 the for this compromise that Kojev failed to note. It's the fact that this whole infrastructure of freedom only works if it discounts environmental externalities. And this means Two things. First, that during the whole process of modernization, and in particular uh, uh, in the post war period, the collective relationship to the future is more and more defined by secular hope carried out by technological development. What we could call with uh, Ernst Cassirer the secular theodicy. That is, at the same time, the foundation of the political liberal order and the product of those land improving, productivity extending technology. By that I mean affluence or if you want growth. And the second consequence is that most institutions that have been associated with the forest compromise and industrial democracy are suspended to what we could call with John Rawls, 
the day of reckoning. I am here referring to a wonderful paper written, written by Stefan Eich, an historian of ideas, on the idea of growth in uh, John Rawls' uh, uh, work. The, the, the expression, the day of reckoning, means that the welfare capitalist class structures remain stable and situated within the democratic norms of government as long as the mechanisms of growth, of elite legitimacy and justice as fairness are sustained by a never extending, extending pioneering front of innovation, of industrial development and patterns of consumption. consumption. So to put it in other words, all this holds, all this is, is sustained only if the material infrastructures involved in the production of modern freedom are either well-functioning, and by that I mean that they provide growth, development, the satisfaction of secular demands, or either manage to hide their externalities by moving them in space, for example, by importing energy and exporting waste, what some author call the ec ecological and equal exchange, or by moving them in time. For example, the, ca the very French case, or even German case, of, of how nuclear waste is somehow stored in the future, okay? Kept for later. So uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Rawls means when he writes about the day of reckoning, it's that he supposes that one day, in the more or less near future, this whole infrastructure of freedom will collapse. That's that's his own words in the treaty in the in the theory of justice. Uh, so in a way, we manage to buy time by accumulating ecological debt, and this is not only a physical reality; it's a fully political process because it's integral to the stability of a political economic system. So. The relevant question here is the following, how production and protection, social protection, will coexist after the day of reckoning, will coexist in the 21st century. Since protection, and by protection I mean fairness, political stability, the subordination of the Darwinian or Hobbesian war of all against all by welfare, and the provision of basic needs and safety nets. So since all this, all those protection, social protection devices is premised on production, on total production to borrow from Carl Schmitt again. Uh, and that energy intensity comes with a massive ecological foot footprint, as you know, the question arises of the future of this political model, of what can be conceived to maintain the social ideal of collective protection in a finite world. So in other words, post-war uh, welfare or social democratic systems are the most concrete expression of what had been previously conceived by modern political thinkers in early, uh, in well, through the 16th, 16th and 17th century in Europe which is the pact between the conquest of civic autonomy and the conquest of material affluence, or the pact be between the idea that humankind makes its own history and transcends nature by uh, 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 providing material uh, 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 affluence. So this is, uh, what sometimes in the book I call the capture of our sense of freedom and justice by grossmanship, by productivity politics. And I want to stress uh, an aspect of this idea that might be, uh, 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 that is um, that's a difference between mainstream political ecology, difference be with people like Marcuse to talk about German thinker or uh, André Gors or Ivan Illich in, in France. The difference is that when I say that freedom has been captured 
by grossmanship, I do not mean that it is a degraded form of freedom. I do not mean that uh, 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 it is something that strategically hides a true or authentic freedom, which would be uh, uh, unhindered, which would be, I would say in French, sans entrave. I claim that there is no other modern freedom than this one. Freedom has a material history. It has been defined, crafted by a set of ecological devices and practices. And there is nothing beyond or below those historical ecological processes. The way we relate to future possibilities, the way we relate to self-actualization, all this is never detached from material possibilities. Or in other words, there is no pure, pure, pure uh, essential freedom that is not somehow defined by uh, 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 ecological possibilities. Our very own conception of freedom depends on how we use land, how we relate to resources, to territories, how we develop knowledge, and in our case, modes of relation to nature defined by the, then by the incremental elimination of want. So now, saying that those infrastructures of freedom have become unsustainable comes with huge consequences. It simply means that a different sense of freedom must be developed on the remains of the previous one, that there is a continuity in the value we give to emancipation, to freedom, and at the same time, a massive discontinuity in how we ground it in, so to speak, material supporting systems. So if freedom were a trans-historical essence, uh, 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 it would be very easy to retrieve it from its capture by industrial capitalism and growth, but it's not. Freedom has been changed, so to speak, forever. Energy intensive forms of freedom have become a standard with some level of irreversibility. It's an historical and ecological ideal, and we are at a turning point of its history since we are facing the question of its reinvention. So this rather speculative point has very concrete implications for, uh, for the green left debate. So lots of people in the intellectual world and in social movements are now convinced that the climate issue is a social issue, that ecology and class structure are related or uh, 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 that carbon emissions and inequalities have to be connected somehow, not only because they are, but because it helps building a large social coalition interested in decarbonizing the economy. So clearly my own research, my own work is obviously a byproduct of this new arrangement between social movements of the left and environmentalism. Uh, 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 it's a byproduct of the debate over, for example, the Green New Deal. But there are different understandings of what this all means philosophically and politically. So if I have time, I would like just to, to, uh, to stress two different debates related to this uh, issue of affluence and freedom. Uh, okay. So here is, here is the, the, the first issue I like to develop. For some people in the, what we could call the, the green Marx universe or the, 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 the red green universe, the climate issue and the social issue completely and ideally overlap. This means that the fight against fossil fuel companies, the fight against fossil capital to borrow from uh, Andreas Malm and its legal infrastructure this is an expression of the divide between the interest of the majority or the, the working class and the vested interest in, the, in status quo and destruction. Closing, and this time I borrow from uh, 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 um, uh, John Foster, closing the metabolic rift between man and nature becomes, so to speak, the historical task of the subaltern. The argument is very easy to get. 
and serves as a convenient bridge between environmentalists and leftists until there is no difference at all, until the green depoliticization disappears and the ecological crisis is somehow reduced to the power of capital over the general interest. So, I mean, the, the, the underlying idea of everything written in the universe of uh, 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 green Marxism relies on this idea, the idea that there is a, 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 a complete and ideal overlap between class struggle and environmental issue or the climate crisis. But the problem is that, and to be clear, I don't agree with this understanding of the situation. So, because what fossil capital sells is not only a dangerous product, it's also the pivot of our economic system. It offers jobs, it pays for social security and prosperity. It's a way of life that is deeply entrenched in an energy intensive mode of development. It's related to how we conceive our movement in space, our privacy, et cetera, et cetera. The cultural aspects of the fossil fuel civilization are numerous. So energy is, to speak like uh, 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 Stanley Jevons in the 19th century, is a universal service that not only generates profit and lobbyism, but also ordinary practices and representations. And that's the reason why there there actually is no perfect overlap, no perfect alignment between the interest of the majority of the worker or the people and the fight against fossil capital. Most people are trapped in a fossil fuel form of freedom and autonomy. And you can't deny that it's a true freedom and a true autonomy for them. And they either close their eyes to the climate catastrophe because it questions their very uh, livelihood or sometimes, many times, actively fight against green politics, understood as a source of constraints of encumberment. And this is what uh, the American sociologist Mark Bliss calls the carbon coalition. The carbon coalition is the heterogeneous social collective that holds a more or less conscious interest in sustaining the carbon economy and form of life. It's part, part white collar, part blue collar, part labor, part, part capital. And that has been skillfully pushed at a prominent place by the conservatives in liberal democracies and most spect spectacularly, obviously, by the US Republican Party. The fact that this coalition is fundamentally short lived, suicidal, and absolutely unaccountable for future generations doesn't weigh much against the very, the very prosaic reality of current attachments to the fossil fuel forms of life and, so to speak, to the lo loyalty to fossil elites it generates. So, to uh, keep borrowing from Mark Bliss, uh, facing the carbon coalition, there is what we could call a post-carbon coalition made up by upper middle class, urban, educated people, people like us working in intellectual professions, and some segments of popular classes, and even some segments of the upper class. But this coalition is trapped between its social interests. For example, uh, uh, they want to not share access to uh, higher education. And the fact that it considers itself a savior of the general interest, or even a bearer of what Hegel used to call in the, 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 the philosophy of law, a universal point of view. People, people like us consider themselves the, 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 the human incarnation of a, 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 a universal set of values or a, a universal class, now clearly explicitly borrowed from Hegel. So this, upper middle class left green coalition well first it is still shy of a democratic demographic majority and even worse it is politically condemned to inaction by its own contradictions as for example illustrated 
by the, 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 uh, the US Democrat establishment. Um, well, so could give you further development on this uh, uh, issue, but I, 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 I will skip to the, the second point I want to make about the, the dilemmas of uh, 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 social protections after the myth of total production. So this was the first one, the debate between uh, 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 green Marxism and more, I think, more precise and more subtle, subtle takes on how class structure and uh, 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 environmental issues uh, uh, play out together. Um, okay. The second deba deb debate uh, 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 I wanted to address and that is relevant for the theory of and history of social production in the 21st century concerns uh, uh, green modernism. So in, in philosophical terms, it is about dec decarbonizing, is it, uh, I'm sorry, I'm starting over. Is it about decarbonizing the same patterns of development and political legitimacy that prevailed in the past? So an energy intensive society, with growth, with labor-friendly policies, but with renewables or renewables and nuke? Or is it about pushing for post-fossil, uh, I'm sorry, still the same idea. Is it pushing for post-fossil Fordism? Or is it about moving away from energy intensive forms of life altogether? That is a huge question. And again, I think uh, both the intellectual world and the left are divided on this issue at the benefit of conservatives. So for decades, the climate issue remained in a dead end because no constituted political power could conceive a retreat from fossil fuels otherwise than a loss of power and domestic legitimacy. The fact that, for example, American lifestyle is non-negotiable, this model, this, this expresses deeply entrenched power structures and the balance between, on one side, the risk of political delegitimization and the risk on the other side of ecological collapse. And this balance always tilted on the side of status quo, uh, uh, on the fact that American lifestyle was non-negotiable. This status quo changed in recent years, not because the establishment became more enlightened or more sensitive to green ideas, but because technological evolutions and security issues changed the landscape. Ren renewables became less expensive, and with them, electricity-based production systems and modes of transportation. At the same time, more or less, military agencies re-qualified the climate crisis as a poten potential source of serious destabilization. So the balance of interest started moving. Delay became a less attractive option, even for politically conservative people and investors. And a, a, a key element in this process is the leadership of China in the struggle for new markets, for innovation and extraction pushed all this push toward a silent revolution. The silent revolution is the fact that the material basis of power might switch from fossil fuels to strategic materials, battery technology, and microchips, green tech. In this context, the possibility of a Green New Deal appeared as a winning policy design. The complete reinvention of modes of production of transportation systems, of housing infrastructures. All this would provide jobs, would provide growth, and with jobs and growth, equality, political uh, uh, stability, just like fossil fuels used to do in risk. So you rem remember maybe uh, last year, Prevention of prosperity regime. Can you hear? I see that there is a. Okay. In fact, 
it's more than a, a win-win uh, a, a, a bet. Could uh, talk about a win-win-win because it's about it, you win on climate, you win on jobs, and you win on the stability of the international order. So that's what some experts call the green swan, the sudden alignment of capital interest in decarbonation, redistributive policies, and, and neo-Keynesian macroeconomic devices. This path of action, as you know, is now stranded in the US and in Europe, uh, but it still appears as the main viable option for contemporary progressive politics. So this is the, the, the first side of the two options as I described previously, the, re the re reinvention of growth and productivity. But at the same time, many energy specialists and left-leaning environmentalists warned that the ecological footprint of renewables was heavy. It's heavy in terms of water use, chemical use, and it also provokes uh, conflicts between food-oriented land use and energy-oriented land use. All this raises ecological questions about the dream of a post-fossil material and political order that is premised on the continuity of the energy-intensive model. In more realist terms, extractive bottlenecks on lithium, cobalt, and other strategic minerals raise the issue of geoeconomic tension arising from those new supply chains or even challenge the mere feasibility of a re renewable-based modern society. Uh, for example, uh, 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 um, many extractive conflicts in uh, 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 South America have been documented uh, in price of the new Western green lifestyle, while they are struck, stuck in environmentally damaged regions with few projects for adaptations. So what is what appears as a win-win-win solution from the perspective of the north of the most affluent uh, societies uh, 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 appears as a double loss from the po point of view of the south. It's an even and combined ecological catastrophe and even in Europe, the question arises. Uh, you probably saw the, the, the case of this uh, lithium mine project in Serbia that is currently fought against by people who refuse to sell their mountains for cheap and greenwash somehow the German consumer who wants to ride his electric Volkswagen. So as you can see behind the motto, electrify everything, there is a deeply political choice and a very serious reflection on what modernity is in other words, it is possible to sustain democratic regimes based on welfare, on a certain sense of material possibilities, let alone secular hopes. It is possible to sustain the urban lifestyle that is so closely associated with modern civic freedoms without ruining the world. Some people on the left insist that the energy intensive lifestyle can be saved through energy efficiency, electrification, a better provision of energy saving public infrastructures and renewables or and or nuclear. More significantly, they insist it's the only option we have to involve the working class in the climate fight. And that's where my two points of debate join together. One of the most uh, 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 crucial aspects of this green modernism is that it is supposed to provide uh, 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 um, the conquest of a majority of, a, of, a, of an extended post-carbon coalition, but with the, 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 the uncertainty about the sustainability of this very new mode of development. So this is where my two points of uh, debate uh, 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 are brought together. So the tension between freedom and affluence manifests itself in the society under many different forms. There are at least the two, those two debates I summarized about the overlap of class interest and climate politics and the debate about the trajectory of modernization. 
All this reveals that the climate issue is not a matter of believe the science, as the recent success movie Don't Look Up seems to indicate, but instead, uh, instead an historical crisis rooted, deeply rooted in the capture of our political condition by fossil fuels. Our lifestyles, our modes of production and the occupation of territory, our political regimes and modes of legitimation, the international order. And it's impossible to conceive a perpetuation of the same type of social organization under a completely different material regime. It comes and it comes at a moment of general demobilizations by decades of neoliberalism. And there is no guarantee that the democratic system is adapted to impulse the necessary change because it is rooted in the political stability provided by cheap energy and insensibility to risk. So we are in a situation where we know we can't save everything. In a way, we have to choose to pick up a few elements in the list of things we care about. Prosperity, private life, unencumbered movement, health, good jobs, the liberal order. I mean, to, to joke, I could tell, tell you, uh, in this list, pick only four and give up the other. And the, 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 the tragedy inside the tragedy that we, we have to sell this to a majority or lose everything. So my book ends with a, an uh, inconclusive reflection, but you know, that's what philosophy is always inconclusive. Uh, uh, an inconclusive reflection on how a green counter movement could emerge from the demise of the classic labor-based left and the dead ends of humanitarian environmentalism or catastrophism. But the crucial point here is not to philosophically define or determine what the future left will look like, but to gain clarity about the historical dilemmas we are facing. Ecology is indeed a social issue. It really gives ground to new forms of political conflicts, new forms of politicization. But it's mostly uh, what I like to call a wicked issue. And there are many examples of the wicked politics of the Anthropocene. For example, it is a failure of capitalism, but classic uh, 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 alternatives to capitalism or anti-capitalist movements are not adjusted to respond, as I uh, maybe not demonstrated, but uh, illustrated previously. It is a crisis of modernity, but we might need an even more modernist political discourse to get out of it. Well, to give you uh, uh, further examples of those wicked politics, it is a failure of liberal elites. There is no uh, doubt about it. But as, at the same time, we need scientific elites and highly coordinated social planning to get out of it. So it's both a failure of technocracy, technocratic regime and a call for a new kind of technocracy. One might argue that this failure is, a, is criminal and requires a trial, but at the same time, all this was completely legal. One more example of this wicked politics of the Anthropocene, it is about protecting people from human-induced evils, but the sense of catastrophe and doom often fuels the will to forget about it and enjoy what is left. So I could go on for a while with different examples of those uh, 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 dilemmas which we are facing, but I believe most of these historical uh, 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 enigmas are related to the central question of how we conceive what Karl Polanyi used to call the self-protection of society in a context where productivity has to be reinvented. So here it is. 